The next one is safe train by petition. We now move on to deal with petition regarding the former Middlesex University site in Trent Park, as we are combining this, this with motion 40.4 on the council agenda. Can I invite Councillor J.C. Chalambos to introduce the petition and also move the, move the motion? Mr. Mayor, can you confirm how I have Five minutes? Um, Mr. Five minutes. It's uh, ten minutes and five minutes at the end. Your Worship, uh, the historic mansion and grounds um, at the heart of Trent Park, the four Middlesex University campus, which many of you know well, is very much at risk. Since its sale to Alliance University of Malaysia in 2013, it has suffered a fade of neglect and decay, public access has been restricted, and the future of the site is very much unclear. I am moving this motion and presenting this petition because I believe it's incumbent on this council to take immediate steps to protect Trent Park and to seek its long-term public and sustainable future. I have taken steps to seek cross-party support because I believe this is an issue far too important to fall victim to party politics and I am grateful to Councillors Taylor and Bond for meeting with Councillor Neville, Labour and myself yesterday evening where I felt we discovered that there is much common ground between us. Uh, between our two groups and the substantial issues at, at stake. I've met with the CEO and the Director of the Environment of the Council and I'm confident that they too appreciate the importance of Trent Park and are committed to uh, seeing a positive long-term future for the site. I'm also grateful to English Heritage for making this one of their top national priorities and I look forward to seeing their report to the Council following their site investigation uh, earlier this week. I'm sure that the Council's con conservation enforcement teams will take the necessary actions based on English Heritage's recommendations to secure the fabric of the building, terrace and grounds, and prevent any further damage. Now, to many members in this <coughs> chamber, the reasons why the, Trent Park, the Safe Trent Park campaign was formed is clear. It is clear that in, the absence, in its absence, the fate of Trent Park would be left to chance, much like it was in 2013 when it was last sold. To other members, however, it might not be so clear. They may see it as just another building, that should, be, that should be put far down the council's list of very important priorities. And there are many important priorities that this council faces. But they would be wrong to think that, because we're not just talking about just another historic building, just some grand former country house which no longer fits its original purpose. We're dealing with something altogether bigger than that. Indeed, that's how it began, as a private residence of the elite, where in the 20s, Sir Philip Sassoon entertained royalty like Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, Politicians like Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden, celebrities like Charlie Chaplin and Lawrence of Arabia, and even where a young Queen Elizabeth II used to stay with her sister as a child. Winston Churchill painted paintings there, and the famous artist Rex Whistler painted murals which are still on view in the now sealed off mansion. From being the playground of the elite, however, after World War II, Trent Park took an altogether different role as a place of learning, where initially teachers were trained to deal with the shortage brought about by the deaths of so many during the war. And then as Middlesex Polytechnic and then University's campus, who eventually acquired the freehold, and where thousands of students passed through the corridors and grounds with fond memories and equipped with the skills to further their careers. I apologise uh, for the swift history lesson. Uh, I, feel, I feel that it, it's important to, to set the context uh, before the issues are discussed. Uh, it helps frame it, perhaps, the discussion. Um, and for me personally, it is a role the House played between these two distinct times, its role in the Second World War, that is most interesting. For you see, when it was requisitioned by the War Office in 1939 as a prisoner of war camp, it was anything but. Carefully managed by an officially non-existent branch of MI6, to where Nazi officers were housed, once captured, in luxury, in a manner in which they thought was befitting of their status. In total, 98 senior officers were kept there, including 59 generals, a huge section of Hitler's top military brass. The colonels and generals would arrive at this grand estate and presume that their rank and upper class backgrounds meant that the British were treating them with, with respect. And in many ways they were. Within the barbed wire perimeter, the Germans were pretty much allowed to run the show. But what they didn't realise is whilst they were there, the whole house was compre uh, comprehensively bugged, with cutting edge listening equipment feeding through to the M room in the basement, where every conversation the Nazis had was listened to and recorded. 
with microphones in the trees and in the gramophones, there was little information that escaped British intelligence's ears. And what did we learn? Well, I won't trouble you with too much more of a history lesson, but one example of the intelligence learned at Trent Park was the existence of Hitler's V1 and V2 missile program and the development of Hitler's atomic bomb, upon which Churchill <coughs> immediately launched Operation Crossbow, in which the RAF destroyed the missile development site in August 1943, pushing back the development of the rockets by eight months, long enough to proceed with the D-Day landing. Historians now claim that without that knowledge, D-Day could not have happened, those missiles would have rained down on London, and the war would have been lost. Now, with much of this information only recently coming to light with the declassification of documents, officially the operation at Trent Park did not exist for decades. Some historians are now claiming World War II could not have been won without Trent Park, that it was as important as Bletchley in the war effort. And what about the secret listeners? 103 in total spread across three sites, Trent Park, Latimer House and Wilton Park. These were young men, generally Jewish refugees who fled Nazi Germany, uh, persecution there, and then came and joined British armed forces to fight against Hitler. Their role in the war officially didn't exist either. They got no medals, they received no recognition. There is no tribute to them anywhere, and there are just two survivors left to tell the story. 96-year-old Fritz, Lust Fritz Lustig is one of them. And I'm fortunate that he's backing this campaign. I'm very grateful to him for doing so. He even spoke at a public meeting the other week. Furthermore, what about these other two sites? Well, one was demolished, and the other is a hotel. Therefore, if ever any tribute is going to be erected to, the, to one of these individuals, what better place than the last remaining site available, and from a historian's perspective, the most important of the three, Trent Park? Now, I know what you're thinking. Nice idea. But who's going to pay for it? Well, the man who painted the blue room at the Trent Park, Winston Churchill, said that politics is the art of the possible. And I believe that with a little bit of imagination, a sprinkling of vision, and a shed load of tenacity and hard work, we as a council can achieve something truly remarkable at Trent Park. In this 70th anniversary of World War II, what better time to begin that process? I want to be clear, though. I'm not asking Infill Council to buy the site. I know Infill Council doesn't have the money. In an ideal world, it would have the money, it would do the noble thing and CPO it for the public benefit. But with that in mind, what I'm asking the council to do is take some simple steps that will cost the council little, but could reward this borough with a well-managed, sustainable, protected public asset, which I'm convinced if handled properly, <coughs> put this borough on the map for all the right reasons. The petition seeks that firstly, permanent public access is granted across the grounds and mansion. These, this public access was enjoyed for decades during Middlesex University's ownership and has subsequently sort of been taken away. Security company on site is, generally speaking, restricting people from freely roaming across the grounds, which naturally many members of the public are unhappy with. A new owner could theoretically fence the site off tomorrow, uh, permanently restricting public access. And I think the council can certainly take steps in looking at the planning statement, revising it potentially, and taking other measures to secure permanent public access. The petition also asks the council to actively consider a long-term public use of the mansion, uh, perhaps similar to what I've outlined earlier uh, in, my, in my comments, um, but potentially something in relation to the role it played in World War II. It can do this by reaching out to the correct institutions, of which there are many, the benevolent trusts, of which there are many. Uh, there are so many bodies and individuals and charities out there that promote and protect anything related to the war that I'm sure the money's out there, it's just a matter of finding it. And first and foremost, the most urgent thing is to grant it the status of, her of, a of an asset of community value. The application is before the council. Um, the council has got up to eight weeks to consider it, but I don't see why it should take so long personally. It's quite straightforward. And frankly, w once that's granted, if it is granted, it gives the community <coughs> a window of opportunity, a six-month window in which a bid can be uh, constructed, uh, invited from external trusts or bodies, and presented to the owners um, uh, who they can potentially sell to. This council, uh, in my view, has a real opportunity here. Um, it has the opportunity to lay the groundwork to encourage the right sort of new owner to come along to Trent Park. There's a great deal of uncertainty at the moment as to who owns it and the current p financial position and situation of the owners. Um, the, uh, officially, technically speaking, the, the, the university that bought it in 2013 is still registered as the owners, 
It seems that they're trying to sell it. Some rumors are they've already found a new buyer. But the point is that there's no time to lose on this. If we're going to do something, it needs to be registered as an asset of community seconds. before that opportunity is lost. I urge this council to rally together to see the wood for the trees, to take the necessary steps now that will make us all proud tomorrow. I urge this council to support this petition <coughs> and this motion and give its support to saving Trent Park. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, it is seconded. Uh, I propose to reserve my right to speak because I do know, as a result of the discussions we've had, that Councillor Taylor will move in Memphis shortly, uh, and I'd like to speak to that. Okay. Any other members who wish to speak? Councillor Taylor.
opportunity of, of uh, engendering initiative and in, in, in bringing together people who may well have the ability and the means to do that which is needed up there, uh, which is clearly to spend some money, not just now, but on an ongoing basis, Mr. Mayor, in order to make sure that the thing is maintained. And so I think that the proposals that are contained in, in this, mo in this uh, amended, uh, amended, effectively amended motion uh, do satisfy uh, our desire to see those sorts of things achieved. And I think if we actually implement what is proposed here, um, I think the petitioners can be, can be reasonably pleased with the outcome of their petition. They're quite right to have made this petition, and I congratulate them for doing so, uh, because it, is, it does sometimes, I'm a great believer, as you've heard me say before, in people power. And uh, sometimes you need a bit of people power to actually get something moving. Uh, and this is a prime example of where that people power has worked. It's brought the matter here. It's, it's brought us together uh, as an administrative authority to hopefully bring about a proper uh, and ongoing solution to this problem so it's a solution I recognise, and I think members on this side recognise, uh, is not one which we, which we can wholly uh, dispense. There is a solution out there. We need to use our facilitation expertise to actually uh, garner on the right people uh, for the, and the right purposes to get that building back in order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other members wish to speak? Councillor Ryan? No. Yes. Councillor Pierce. Councillor Pierce. Councillor Pierce. Thank you very much. Ever since I moved to this borough 45 years ago, I've always enjoyed the facilities that Trent Park has had to offer. Its peace and tranquility is a real tonic. To find such a beautiful place so near to London is unique and also so near to a tube station to, in, 
enable people from other parts and other boroughs to come and enjoy it also. As we all know, we have beautiful parts in London, so why don't we put all our efforts, which hopefully we have agreed to, into ensuring that we keep our crown in the jewel. Our jewel in the crown, I should say. <laughs> when my children were young, we would always take them to Trent Park to show them the beauty of the lakes, the zoo and the wildlife to enhance their education, let alone the gardens that we that used to have beautiful azaleas. On many occasions, we would note the people having barbecues in a safe environment, allowing their children to play happily. The history surrounding the house is part next to none. And Jason's given a very good history lesson tonight. I really enjoyed it, so I'm not going to go on about that. I was, but I don't need to. That apart, I feel it is necessary to take action to ensure that we don't end up with more problems than maybe we have at the moment. If we were to find another consortium to take the house, I hope we would take the necessary steps that they have a clear understanding of this unique asset to the London Borough of <coughs> Enfield of the house and park, and, and ensure that we would take the necessary steps to restore the house to its former glory. So therefore, I ask you to support the motion, not just for the residents of Cock Fosters, but the whole of the borough. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Anybody wish to speak on his side? Councillor Sir Ramos. One of the first things I want to say is that uh, one of the bits of history that we have in place is that the Middlesex University vacation, um, and it was a, a crime shame that we lost the Middlesex University. Yeah. So it was only from Trek Park, it was from Cat Hill, uh, and we've seen what's, uh, what's happened at Cat Hill with the development there. Uh, we've lost our students as well. When you go into Barnet, one of the first things you see is a sign underneath Welcome to Barnet saying, the home of Middlesex University. And it's a crime shame that that actually happened. Uh, and that's one of the one of the sad things that's led to the situation we're in today. Um, Mr Mayor, I support the, uh, the amendment, so please extend cross price support. But we must have no illusions that the task ahead is to find somebody with £30 million pounds to acquire the signs uh, and have it for a facility that has public access. It's a tall order. Mr Mayor, I've been there before with the issues of uh, Broomfield House. Broomfield House, um, maybe it's, uh, it's a smaller building and one that's sat up uh, damage uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, the, the gap there is 3 million, and the struggle to find 3 million, uh, which um, will very much benefit from, uh, from the private sector in, in actually helping restore that to its own glory. So, this is this will be a tool of the tool deal, uh, a tool all that we'll struggle to, to get there. But I'm, I'm convinced that with the right people on the panel, we'll make great progress and help preserve. Thank you, Worship. I'd just like to uh, develop a point that uh, Councillor Cheryl Ambus uh, uh, made, uh, uh, Bambos Cheryl Ambus, and that's the uh, right, uh, getting the right people uh, on the panel. Um, it, it, it's nicely open worded here, so we're not constraining ourselves in terms of what we're doing, how we're doing it. But I think, in terms of the working group, it would be useful even if such people were non-voting members, to be able to co-opt uh, members of the community, for example, uh, members of uh, uh, the Friends of Trent Park, uh, for example, to make sure that there's continuing buy-in uh, by the community and, and dialogue. The second thing I would ask is that the members of the working group be properly advised uh, in the sense that there's a number of statutory powers that the council does have to deal with listed buildings which are in a state of disrepair. And I think it would be useful, uh, given the complex nature of the law, uh, if the uh, lawyers and planners on the council uh, could provide uh, the working group uh, with a synopsis uh, of the various powers that are available uh, to, to the council, and in fact, uh, the duties as well. It will make sure that all options are considered. 
uh, and we can then actually look at some of the ramifications uh, of using some of the options and powers. I think what we don't want this to be uh, is simply a talking shop uh, without uh, members on that panel uh, being fully aware of why they're there and what powers they have to, uh, uh, to act. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Any other member who should speak? Okay, Councillor Jason Chalhamus, would you like to uh, exercise your right of reply? Is this on the amendment? Uh, is this on the amendment, Your Worship? Or? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Your Worship, I am uh, grateful to Councillor Taylor for presenting this amendment. Um, it was something that we discussed and we, we worked through together. Um, <coughs> It, it differs. It differs slightly from <coughs> from my original uh, motion. It's, it, in my view, it's not as it's not as sort of demanding, if you like, on the council. But I appreciate that with the with the constraints we have from a legal perspective, that we we should tread carefully. Um, and with that in mind, I'm I'm very happy to support uh, Councillor Taylor's amendment. Okay. Councillor Fair. Um, I'd like to thank for his contributions from members on both sides uh, on this particular issue. I think the amendment of the now motion by the ministry uh, is permissive, and I think to take uh, the points of Council Adams, I think that the working group was constituted uh, needs to consider <coughs> more precisely in terms of reference, more precisely how, how the wishes to progress. I can presume we have a conversation with Council Neville in due course because we have to leave the United States the numbers of the work here because there is a little bit of work to be done there. But I thank you as obviously that members of my time will be in that unanimity, which will allow the doubt to cease after we agree with this particular promotion. Okay, we are uh, we now going to move the amendments on the vote. All those in favour? That's great. It's <laughs> stunning. It's, like it's, very, it's very rare to see this. It took your last meeting, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my last yeah. meeting. Yeah. I, was a bit, I, was a bit, I was a bit shocked, to be honest. That becomes a sufficient motion and, and we have to vote again. Yeah, All those in favor? Yes. All those against? Any twice, abstention? Twice in one night, Mr. Mayor. You're surprising me tonight. 